All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Accounting Ethics. My name is Professor Stevens, and I will be your instructor for the summer course, Accounting Ethics. Um, I know there's probably a thousand other things you'd rather do with your Monday nights on the summers than be here and sitting in the classroom or watching the video. But hopefully, um, I, we're going we're gonna to try our best to make this an interesting class for you guys, to make it well worth your time to come here every Monday night for the next 11 weeks. Okay? Uh, the more inve you invest in the class, the more you effort you put forth, the better it tends to be. If everybody doesn't do very much or doesn't put forth much effort, then the class will seem like it kind of goes very slow. Okay? So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, to start off with, um, I know some of you, two of you in the class, but there are a lot of you that I don't know. So let me just do a brief introduction, let me give you a little bit of information about who I am, my background, um, and why I'm standing here um, to teach you ethics. I've been in the trenches, as they say. Um, I'm a native-born Texan. I was born and raised in the Houston area. And in terms of my higher education, I went to community college my first couple of years in the Houston area. Um, back then it was called North Harris County College, now it's called Lone Star College. Um, so I did the community college thing for a couple of years. I was the first person in my family to ever go to college. Uh, so I was a first generation college student and so I didn't have anybody kind of leading me along giving me information about what you're supposed to do when you go to college. It was all new to me and I was basically learning it on my own. So um, I chose the community college route because it was cheaper, classes were smaller, and I came from um, a rural school where classes were really small. Uh, my first collegiate experience, I started out, I have to, I have to tell you this, full disclosure. Uh, my first week of college I spent at the University of Houston in downtown Houston, outside of downtown. And all five classes that I went to that week, freshman year, were all 500 seat auditoriums, I kid you not. Um, and that's when I decided real quickly, it's like, mm, I don't think this is where I'm supposed to be. So that's why another reason I went to community college. And so I found that to be, uh, the community college route to be very uh, rewarding. And it was a good foundation for me. Um, I graduated towards the top of my class in high school, so you know I knew what was going on. I was a relatively smart individual, uh, smart enough to know where I wasn't going to be and where I needed to be. So I got my uh, associate's degree at the junior college, then transferred to Sam Houston State University. Anybody from Sam Houston degrees? Bearcats? No. Okay. Um, got my bachelor's degree in accounting. Went to work in Houston for Pennzoil. Anybody heard of Pennzoil? Yeah. Don't hear too much about them anymore. They got bought up by another energy company, but you still see the yellow bottles um, of Pennzoil sitting on the shelves in the uh, automotive stores. So I worked for them the first few years out of college, and I did auditing, I did revenue, accounting, paying royalties to gas, natural gas owners. Very interesting experience, very eye opening. And after about three years of working in oil and gas, I decided I wanted to go back and further my education. And so I decided I wanted a master's degree, but I wanted my master's degree to be in tax. And at that point in time, there were not a lot of universities that offered programs in tax, so my choices were very limited. And so I moved and went to the Metroplex, moved up to the Dallas area, went to the University of Texas at Arlington. I uh, took a job working for another oil and gas firm, much smaller firm this time, also doing revenue accounting, and did work during the day and went to master's school at night, which I did most of the first few years of my life during college. When I went to community college, and except for the last year of the university, I pretty much worked full time and went to school at night. So I know what a lot of you are doing by being here in night classes. And I know most of you probably have daytime jobs, you've got families, you've got obligations, this is not your entire life. And I understand that, I sympathize with you. Um, so I've been there and I've been down that path, just so you know. 
uh, let's see. So worked during the day, went to master's school at night, finished that, finished my master's degree, went to work, moved out of the um, oil and gas industry, went to work for utility companies. Uh, went to work for a company in Dallas that owned several electric utilities that operated in Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma. Worked in the utility industry for the company in Dallas for about eight years. The company was bought out in a merger. At that point, I was kind of in middle management, and in mergers and acquisitions, the first spots to get cut are the middle managers. That's where the easiest way to cut costs are. So I got eliminated, my job got eliminated as part of the merger. I decided I didn't want to move to Columbus, Ohio. Um, and so I set out to look for another job. Took a, a job doing financial reporting with a utility based in Michigan. So I moved to East Lansing, Michigan. That was back in 2000. Spent nine years uh, living in lower Michigan. Seven of those years I worked for the utility there in Michigan. And that was a very enlightening experience. Uh, while I worked for the utility in Michigan, we had a subsidiary, an energy marketing subsidiary. Um, and I was, I took over the position as general manager or the general accounting manager back in 2002, just before Arthur Anderson started to crumble. This was about, Enron was in the news, and so I had just taken this position with the energy marketing firm, and so I was kind of very close to that situation, far closer than I wanted to be, but I can tell you more stories about that as we go through the course. Um, I decided along 2008, I think it was, um, well, I decided in 2004 that I thought that my accounting career had pretty much run its course. Um, had worked a lot of overtime uh, during 2002 to 2004. We were working six, seven days a week, 12 to 14 hours a day. And so I got very burned out from, from that experience. So I thought, okay, I need, I'm not ready to retire. I'm not at that point in my life. I'm gonna need another career. I'm gonna have to find something else to do. So working um, pretty much about 60 hours a week and decided to go to law school. And fortunately, there was a program that offered classes on the weekend. So I could work during the week and go to law school on the weekend. So I did that for a couple of years. And then company decided to downsize. They were going to implement some new um, enterprise resource systems, which was going to significantly reduce the number of um, accountants that were needed. And so since I knew I didn't have long-term plans of staying there because I was in law school, I went to my boss and said, okay, um, put my name in for the severance package. You know I'm in law school, so um, I'll take the severance package and I'll, I'm going to go finish school. So that's what I did. I left there in 2007, so then I spent about two more years finishing up law school, stayed an extra year, and um, studied or updated my tax knowledge. So I graduated with my JD from law school. So my education and my background, I'm, t I'm trained to be a tax attorney. Um, and I do help people from time to time. I do not have an active law practice here in Texas. I'm not licensed to practice in law in Texas. Um, I am licensed in Michigan. So don't ask me for legal advice. Otherwise, I get in very serious trouble. Um, but if you have tax questions, I can answer tax questions. So. Anyway, so you're probably thinking, well, if you're trying to you spend all that time and money and effort to be a tax attorney, why are you standing here at a community college? Well, back during that time frame, 2008 and 2009, this is going to come later in the term, we're going to talk about what life was like in the U.S. at that time. You guys all remember what was going on back then, right? Mm -hmm. Financial institutions, everything started to crumble, the economic system, and financials system was just about to crater. So as a result of that, with the recession looming, nobody was hiring attorneys, nobody was hiring accountants. And so here I was, I just finished law school and had all these student loans. And so I had to figure out, okay, so what am I going to do with this degree that I have? And so one of the skills that I realized during law school that I had was helping other people understand accounting information. One of the classes that was required during law school was all, all lawyers that got a JD degree 
were required to pass an individual income tax class. And so my peers found out after I took tax, after a while, after they got to know me, that I had a background in tax. And so rumors started to spread, well not rumors, information started to spread. And so they started looking to me to help them through their classes. One of my colleagues came to me um, in law school, the way it was set up is we had 15 week terms and there were three terms each year. And the 15th week was what we considered finals week. It was where you did your final exam, that's all you did that week. So there's like 14 weeks worth of class face-to-face -face interaction with the professors. A colleague of mine comes to me in week 13 of a 15 week term. She says, I'm going to fail this tax class. I don't get it, I don't understand it. She said, can you help me? And I said, well, why didn't you come any sooner? <laughs> She's like, well, I know, I know. I said, but setting that aside, I will work with you and we'll see what we can do and I don't promise anything at this point because you've got very limited time. She had finals, I had finals, and so we worked together and she passed the class with a C minus. Okay. Uh, so that's credit in law school. C minus is credit, you move forward, you're done. And she was one of those individuals that she was so thrilled with her C minus that she told everybody she knew. And so that eventually led to me doing uh, small group workshops where, and I still did some one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And then it got to the point where I actually um, worked for the school doing tax workshops for the tax faculty where I actually had classrooms a couple of times a week where well, whatever students were taking the tax course that particular semester, um, I would offer workshops and they could come and I would cover tax material with them. And so I did that and that's kind of where I discovered this uh, gift that I've been given where I can stand up in front of a classroom and communicate fairly complicated information and help people. And I got a lot of self-satisfaction from that. Far more satisfaction helping individuals than I ever got working for 20 plus years in corporate America trying to benefit some faceless shareholder. Okay. So when I left law school, education was definitely on the radar. And so I accepted a position. I taught for three years at Northern Michigan University, which is way, way up in very northern Michigan, above Wisconsin. You guys familiar with Lake Superior geography? Uh, it's about as far north as you can go before you hit Canada. Um, taught, for there, taught there in the business school for three years, upper division courses, juniors and seniors. And then I moved back to Texas for personal reasons, family reasons. I taught for a year over at Blaine College over in Bryan. And for the past two years, I've been here at ACC, teaching in the program, the professional accounting program here. And I will start my third year in the fall. So that's kind of my background, kind of in a nutshell. Um, that's kind of who I am, why I'm here, how I got here. And I'll give you guys a, a chance a little bit later on to share some information about each of you with your classmates. Um, one of the skills that you guys need to develop is the ability to be able to stand up and communicate both written and verbal you got to be you know a lot of people one of the biggest fears that people have is public speaking they don't like getting up in front of people and talking <laughs> well if you're going to be a cpa a professional individual you've got to get over that fear because that's going to be a significant part of your role as person as a cpa as a professional is at times you're either going to have to do presentations if you work in a corporate environment as a CPA, or if you work for a firm, you're probably gonna have to go out and talk to your clients or do presentations to your clients, explain things to them. So we're gonna do, you're gonna get some practice in this class doing some verbal communications. So we're gonna work on that, okay? All right, so that's who I am. Now, in order to be successful in this class, one of the first things that we're going to talk about, one of the tools that I use pretty extensively to help manage the course, both the classroom and the online version of the, of the course, is Blackboard. Okay, is everybody familiar with Blackboard? If you've taken classes here in the professional accounting program, you should be at this point in your career. All right. I'm going to switch the screen for just a moment. I'm going to switch over to Blackboard. 
is I want to take a few minutes and show you basically how the course is laid out. Now, for purposes of the video, I'm going to turn off part of the lights. Did you that light? Thank you. That's good. That's good. You need to turn it the right one. There we go. That's good. All right. This will help the video. I think that will be, people watching the video will be able to see this a little better. And I think the classroom, you guys can probably see that a little better. Um, this is the course page in Blackboard. When you log into Blackboard, you guys are all on my on my roster. You should be, or I hope you are. We'll figure that out here in just a few minutes. But when you open up the course page, the first thing that you're going to see is the page called announcements. Okay, you're going to want to go out to Blackboard at least a couple of times a week and check this. Okay, now usually what I try to do is if I post an announcement something you need to be aware of, I try to get the system to send out an email. So you should get an email through your ACC email, something you also need to check a couple of times a week, especially during the summer when we're going to be going through the course pretty quickly. So anyway, it's going to, the page opens up to announcements. You've got on the very left-hand side of a menu board that we set up for the course. And my menu board basically starts with your calendar at the very top, okay? Then below that, you've got a folder for orientation, announcements, and tools, okay? Most of the, the stuff that's up here at the top is the stuff you're gonna use the most, with the exception of orientation. After the first week, I will probably turn that orientation folder off because then you won't need that, you won't be going back to that information but you will be using these other tools pretty extensively, okay? The second section in our menu options is you've got my group and a significant portion of the work that you're gonna do in this class is gonna be done in groups. And so I've randomly assigned you groups and we're gonna cover those a little bit later. Uh, for those in the uh, distance learning or the online courses, uh, they will go to this my group tab as well and they will be able to see their group number and the members of their groups. And you guys in the classroom will be able to do that as well. Right below that are discussion boards, okay? Now, discussion boards will be useful in the classroom, but we're gonna have limited use of the discussion boards because most of the group work that we do in the classroom is gonna be done inside the classroom. For those that are taking the distance learning sections, this is their, the discussion board is their classroom, okay? That's where they have the discussion that we're actually gonna do in the class here. That's where that's gonna take place. So for those of you that are taking the classroom section, there will be limited use of the discussion boards. And then the next section says ethics case assignments. The case assignments that are assigned to you to work on each week, your case modules, uh, reside here. Although, let me caution you about that you actually will look for these assignments. This is just kind of a quirk in Blackboard. You'll actually look under under my group. You'll see the assignments listed under my group. Because the assignments, when I made those and I assigned them, I assigned them to groups, not to individuals. So it's going to show up on your group page when you go look for that. Okay. Moving down the folders, uh, project. You guys are going to have a project that you're going to work on for me later in the term. Okay. Um, you typically you're going to start this project after you finish chapter six in your textbook. So you've got a significant amount of material to cover before you need to be thinking about the project. But we're going to kind of plant the seed tonight and just be aware. We'll talk a little bit more about what that project is going to constitute and what you're going to do there. Almost not every week, but most weeks where you don't have an exam. You will have a quiz, okay? And the quizzes will be found in this folder. All of the quizzes, there's a chapter quiz for each chapter in your textbook, and there are due dates for those. Um, we'll give you a little bit more detail about that, but that's where you'll find the quizzes located. We'll go through these kind of item by item in just a minute. At the very bottom is a section called reference documents, okay? Professional standards, okay? When you click on professional standards under reference documents, you will find several different things listed. Okay? You've got the AICPA code of conduct, 
for CPAs that are members of the AI CPA. It applies to all members, whether you're in private practice, public practice, or if you're retired and you're still a member of the AI CPA, code of conduct still applies to you. So that's a link to their code. You're going to take a look at that and use that throughout the term. Then you've got the Texas Administrative Code. Okay? These are the rules that apply to Texas CPAs. So if you have a license in the state of Texas, which I'm assuming because you guys are sitting here, most of you are, or all of you are looking to be licensed in Texas, this code will apply to you, the rules that are here, and you're going get, to get, want to get very familiar with those. I've also given you a link to the Texas Public Accountancy Act, the act that allows the state, uh, Texas State Board of Public Accountancy to license people as professional accountants. You've got a link for that, and then at the bottom, you've got IRS Circular 230, if you're going to be in tax practice, okay? A lot of ethical questions revolve around the tax area. You need to be familiar with IRS Circular 230. These are here primarily for you to use as reference tools. I've just given you very quick links so you don't have to go out and try and search for those on your own. Towards the bottom, under professional standards, you've got PowerPoints that are provided by the uh, publisher that go along with your textbook. You're probably never going to see those in class, okay? Never going to see those PowerPoints, but if you are a student that likes those PowerPoints, needs to see those to refresh or to study from, then they're available for you in the reference section. And then the very bottom item in the uh, menu list is the syllabus, the course syllabus. So I will give you in the classroom tonight a hard copy of the syllabus but if you lose it, you've always got an electronic copy to go out there and reference as long as you log into Blackboard. Okay. All right, so Blackboard I use pretty extensively. Now, both for the online sections and the classroom, let's go back up to the top and I'm going to click on the calendar. And I want you guys to get comfortable with the calendar, okay? I get comments from students, I get feedback in the past couple of terms. One of the critiques is that I don't put all the due dates in my syllabus. Well, the reason I don't do that is because then I have to go back and I have to change the syllabus each and every semester to change the dates, and to me that's inefficient. I think it's better for you, that's my assumption, um, to put the due dates on a calendar so you can see them on the calendar, you can visually see it instead of just a list of dates. So if you get comfortable with the calendar, you'll be able to find everything. Now, the thing that should pop out to you immediately when you look at the calendar is what day is everything on? Fridays, okay? So Fridays are gonna be the big due dates for this class, this term. The assignments, things that are gonna be due are typically going to be due on Fridays. Fridays by midnight Friday, Saturday morning, okay? So when you want to know, for example, this is week one, and right is June the 1st. You've got some things that are due at the end of the week this Friday. So you go to the calendar, which is why I placed it at the top of the menu board, and you click on the first item, and it comes up, it says chapter one quiz. So what does that tell you you need to do? You need to read chapter one, and you need to complete the quiz that you will find listed down here under the quiz folders for chapter one. Okay. Now, that's on the calendar. Let's go down and look at quizzes since you know you have a quiz due. And you'll see the very first item listed is the chapter one quiz. Click on the link. It'll take you to a multiple choice quiz for chapter one. Okay. Now, the chapter quizzes, we'll talk about this when we go through the syllabus typically are 10 questions, each one's worth one point. So these are typically worth 10 points each towards your final grade. Okay. You get two attempts. Okay. So once you start chapter one quiz, you need to work through chapter one in one sitting. You can't stop, close it down, and come back to it later. You've got to finish it once you start it. But that's one attempt. You go through it and finish it the first time. It will grade it tell you which questions you got correct, which ones you missed, okay? Quizzes are an individual assignment, meaning each individual needs to do the quizzes, okay? You get two attempts. 
So for the questions you missed, guess what? Go back, pull out your book, find the answers, and, check, and select the correct answer choice when you do the second attempt. By giving you two attempts, my hope is that you'll get all the questions correct. Okay? So that's something that you do on your own outside of class. It's considered homework. Okay? So you will do those quizzes. It's not every week, but it, because we're only doing 11 weeks in here, uh, it's going to be close to almost every week you'll have a quiz. Okay. All right, towards the end of the term, last week, you had something called a professional standards quiz. This will be a short quiz over those professional standards that we talked about that are at the very bottom in that reference section. The professional standards quiz is worth 20 points. Okay. Questions are a little bit more involved, a little bit more work involved. And the, those answers in the professional standards quiz you will not find in your textbook. So you'll have to go to those reference resources to find the answers for those. <clears throat> All right, so back to our calendar. So first thing is you've got chapter one quiz. It's going to be due by 11.59 Friday night. And there's something else out there. What else is there? Okay, you've got an orientation exercise. Okay. <laughs> The orientation exercise is bonus points. Okay? There's 10 bonus points. There's a brief exercise for orientation. And it basically is set up and designed just to get you comfortable with the layout of the course in Blackboard so you can find where things are at and you know where to go find things. So again, this is worth 10 bonus points, the orientation exercise. So if we go to the second menu item, orientation, you will find the link here. So you just click on that document. Let's just do that, take a look at it. You're going to complete this and you're going to submit it through Blackboard. Please do not email me. You need to submit everything through Blackboard. It's set up so that you can do that. And you will complete this orientation exercise. It's just a series of several steps for you to follow. Very simple, very basic type stuff just to get you introduced to the course and how things work. Um, question number three for you guys here in the classroom. Um, you're not going to need to worry about this. This is not going to apply to you. Um, question number three is primarily for those distance learning students that are outside the Austin metro area taking this course where they have to go to a proctoring center. They have to, their tests have to be proctored just like your test will be proctored. Uh, but they have to go somewhere other than ACC. So question number three is primarily for those folks, so you guys don't have to worry about number three, you can skip that. Um, question number four uh, basically says attend the classroom orientation, which is what you guys are doing right now, and for the online students, it tells them to watch the video, okay, which is why I have to come on the table, because I'm making a recording of this orientation that they will watch online. And then it says, post the answer here, because it says in the video, I'm going to give you an answer to question number four. Okay, So here is the answer to question number four. I'm giving you your answer. Revenue recognition. Revenue recognition. Okay. That's your response for question number four. So you'll just type that in underneath where it says post the answer here. Okay. All right. Question number five. I want you to go out and watch a short tutorial. It's an interactive tutorial that has been set up by the ACC library. Okay? And it covers the academic honesty policy for all students that are enrolled in ACC courses. It's an interactive video, meaning you're going to have to answer some questions and there's a quiz embedded in the tutorial. By the time you finish the tutorial, You'll get a little certificate with your results and it'll say you scored X percentage. I expect you guys to score at least 70%. Okay? Everybody should wind up with 100. It's not very difficult. It's very simple. It takes about 10 minutes to do. Okay? But everyone needs to complete that. Now, and I mean classroom and distance learning. All students, anyone who's enrolled in a course. Why? Well, I'll, I'll save that. I'll save that little surprise for later. Let's just, let's just leave it at this point. Academic honesty is a big deal. Okay? 
All right, so make sure you watch the tutorial. Question number six it says confirm that you have reviewed and understand you understand the course syllabus. I'm going to pass out to the classroom. You guys will all get a hard copy, the last page. You're going to fill it out and you're going to sign it and you're going to give it back to me. So on your orientation exercise, if you were in the classroom section, all you need to do is say, handed it in in class, because I have them already. You do not need to resubmit the form. Okay. Those that are in the online sections will need to submit the form because I obviously haven't collected anything from them. All right, question number seven is about your textbook. Wants to make sure you've got your textbook, got the right edition of the textbook. You need to have the seventh edition. Question number eight says a significant portion of the course, as I mentioned earlier, is done in groups. So you need to put your group number in for question number eight. Again, not hard. You just need to know where to go find that. And I talked about that. Question number nine talks about academic advising. You should have had some sort of communication with Dr. People's office, either advising or an email or a phone call or something that they approved you to actually come and take this course. Okay? All I'm looking for is the date. When did you go to an advising appointment or when did you communicate with Dr. People? And then it tells you there are several different ways. If you're not sure, you can go look that up. He keeps an electronic record and you have access to that. Or if you've got the email, just go pull up the email. Or if you did a telephone call to your best recollection, what was the date? Okay. Number 10, you're going to submit this orientation exercise. You're going to save this in a document, save all your answers in a Word document, and then you're going to upload that document through Blackboard. You're going to submit it. We'll do look at that in just a second. Once you submit your document, then you should be able to go to the, your grade book and you should be able to see a little gold circle that says you've successfully submitted your assignment. Every week when you submit assignments, you need to make sure you go check the grade book and make sure your assignments get submitted correctly. Okay? That's why this step is in here so that you know how to do that. And then the last thing, step number 11, is basically to introduce you to the discussion board. Go out, write a short welcome. Um, to introduce yourself to your classmates. So that's what the orientation exercise is all about. And again, just a reminder for those of you watching the video that are in the online sections, the answer to question number four is revenue recognition. Okay. All right. So you're going to save your answers in a Word document, and then you're going to, once you've saved them into your document, you're going to come back and click on this bold black link and you're going to get a submissions page. Okay. This is very similar to the process for when you're going to submit your weekly group assignments. You're going to do all your work in a Word document. You're going to check it. You're going to check the draft. You're going to do all your work. Then when you're happy with it, you're going to submit as a group one document. Okay. And your, doc, your submission page will look very much like this. It's got the assignment information. And so remember, we're talking about the orientation exercise. This is due Friday, June the 5th by 11.59 p.m. Ten points are possible. Again, these ten points are bonus points. Okay? So if you don't do the orientation exercise, you don't really lose anything in terms of your grade, except you're giving up some bonus points. Okay? And then the document with the instructions, the original document, is this link right here. Now, to submit your responses, you're going to go to section number two, assignment submission, where it says text submission. Well, you, you can either write it in text and submit it, but I don't recommend you do that. That's kind of um, awful looking when it comes through. I would save it in a Word document so you can spell check and grammar check and do all that kind of stuff. And then just attach the file. Hit browse my computer, go find your file, just attach it. And then you're going to come, if you want to add comments, you can down here. You don't have to. But then at the very bottom, you're going to hit the submit button, this little blue button down in the lower right hand corner. And then go check the grade book, look for your little gold circle under orientation exercise. If you see the gold circle, that means you have successfully submitted it. It is now in the grading queue. And I will come back and I will grade. And once I've graded it, that gold circle will get changed to a, a point value when I've graded your orientation exercise. Okay. 
Again, that's going to be due on Friday. Right, any questions about the orientation tab? Okay. Again, I'll leave that out there the first week since it's due on Friday of this week. After that, kind of won't be any purpose to have it out there. So that one will disappear. But you will still have the calendar, the announcements, and the tools. All right, one thing I want to point out about the tools part of the menu. Okay. Um, you may find it necessary at some point to send me an email. Maybe you've got a personal issue. You don't want to post it on the discussion board for everybody in the class to see it. That's fine. If you send me an email, though, I would prefer that you do it through Blackboard. Okay. The reason is that when the message comes through Blackboard to me through my email, it tags it with the class information and I respond, those get my first priority in terms of responses. Okay. So if you send me an email through Blackboard, chances are you're going to get a much quicker response than if you send me an email through your personal email. Okay. The reason for that is this. If you send me an email from your personal email, it could wind up in spam or junk folders. Whereas if you do it through Blackboard, it won't go to spam or junk. And again, I look for those emails with class information. Those get my highest priority because I get a ton of email that I just kind of set up to the side. And it's like when I get to it, I'll get to it. And if I don't ever get to it, then I don't ever look at it. So I want to make sure that I respond to your questions in a timely manner. Now, what type of an expectation should you have about email? Give me 48 hours. Okay. Give me 48 hours to respond to an email. Typically, I will try to get back with you much quicker than that, but this term, this semester, and this is not an excuse, but I'm just kind of letting you know, um, I'm teaching three face-to-face -face classes, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday nights, and then I have the one online section of ethics. So I have almost 100 students this term that I need to respond to on a timely basis when those emails come through. So uh, just keep that in mind. Give me 48 hours. To respond to your email if it gets past 48 hours it's okay to go ahead and send me a follow-up um, what please do not send me an email and then 12 hours later professor I haven't heard from you can you please respond please don't send me those I will respond as quickly as I can I promise okay? if you have something that is drastically urgent then you need to get in touch with me okay? um, typically email is fastest because Email is the thing I'm going to respond to the quickest. Uh, I do want to mention one other thing about contact, and I'll mention this more when we go through the syllabus. Um, I'm going to be on different campuses this semester. On Monday nights, I'm at Northridge. Tuesday and Wednesday nights, I'm at Highland Campus. My office is actually at Rio Grande. So if you leave me a voicemail in my office at Rio Grande, it could be three or four days before I ever see your, or hear your voicemail. So email is the best way to contact me, okay? Discussion boards, I also go through and check those at least once a day. So if it's something, if it's a question that you feel would benefit the entire class, it's not of a personal nature, I'm gonna encourage you guys to use the discussion board. All right, In my group tab, because I'm the instructor, I go out and I click on it, I get all the groups, okay? So I can go look at all the groups. When you do this as an individual, all you're going to be able to see is your group. You will not be able to see the other groups in the class. Okay. So when you click on that, it will give you the members in your group. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. Discussion board. Okay. You should see at least these three different forums that are set up. Okay. You'll have a forum for welcome. This is part of that orientation exercise where you go write your welcome to your, introduce yourself to your classmates. I want you to do that. Just answer those quick questions and then you're done. You've met that particular requirement in the orientation exercise. And I will go look. And if you did, you'll get a point. If you didn't, you won't get a point. So, um, question challenges. Okay. As you do those uh, quizzes, from the chapters in your textbook. If there's a question you want to challenge, you don't understand why the answer is what it is, you think it's wrong, and I will put a disclaimer, 
have found some questions that have been wrong in the database. I mean, sometimes I had to go back and change those. Those I've already changed. I don't expect to see a lot of errors, but if you do, if you find one or you want to challenge a question, please put it here, okay? Um, just be aware that, for instance, let's use chapter one as an example. Chapter one is due this Friday night. You do your chapter one quiz and there's a question, you think, oh, that question just has to absolutely be wrong. It says right here in the book X, Y, and Z, and that's my answer. And I think that's what it's supposed to be. So you go ahead and you put your question challenge out here and you tell me this is my question that I'm challenging. I think the answer should be this. Just be aware, I'm not going to answer that until after the due date on Friday. Okay. You give everybody a chance to answer the questions, finish the quiz, and then if there's any challenges out here, I'll go back and I'll look at them. And if I need to correct them, I'll do them all at one time. Okay. I'm not going to upset the cart in the middle of the process and go back and try and make changes in the middle of a quiz. I'm not going to do that. Okay. So your question challenges typically, typically will get answered after the due date for the quiz. Just make sure that you understand that. Okay. Then if you've got the last forum down here at the bottom are just general classroom questions. You don't remember some policy or something we said we were going to do in class. You got a question about that, general classroom questions is the best place to put that. Okay. Now for the online sections, remember I said the discussion board is basically their classroom. They have a listing of forums underneath these three primary forums for each of the different case modules. Okay, And the online sections will be graded based on their postings to those forums each and every week. Okay. You guys in the classroom, you don't have to worry about that. Okay, and I'll tell you why in just a few minutes. But if you're in the online section, discussion boards, you do need to respond to. Okay. All right, under ethics case assignments, I've got some general instructions. Make sure that you read through these before you submit your first set of answers to your cases. Um, I give you some, some feedback, some recommendations of things I think you should do and things you should pay attention to and how you're going to be um, graded. Now, at this point, most of you should have a bachelor's degree. You should have a bachelor's degree, which means you've got 128 credit hours. You've been studying the professional accounting program either here at ACC or you've taken a fifth year of accounting classes at a university. And you're taking this ethics course because you need to finish that last requirement for the state board which means you're close to that 150 credit hours. Okay? What that tells me as an instructor, what level you are in terms of your education, is you guys are graduate students. I treat you like graduate students. Okay? And this is something that most students don't catch on to in some of my online classes until week four or five. Okay? When I grade your group responses to your questions, I expect graduate level written responses. In other words, I don't want to see spelling errors. I don't want to see gram grammatical errors. I want you guys to fix those. Okay? Which is one reason why you're going to use Microsoft Word or some type of word processor to do those checks. You've got spelling checks, the source checks, grammar checks. So if you are making those mistakes, you can catch those and practice and understand why you're making those mistakes. If, if it happens over and over and over again, Week after week after week, that's something you need to work on. That's something you need to fix. Okay? Because would, would writing cause you to fail the CPA exam? No. Not, there are not enough points allocated to the writing component. But if your writing is poor, could it cause you not to pass? Absolutely. Okay? If you're taking a section of the CPA exam where writing is significant, and your writing is poor, and you're right on the line, and they're trying to determine whether or not they should pass you or not, if your writing is poor, chances are you're not going to pass. Okay? If you have really good writing and communication skills, and you're sitting right, you're teetering right on the edge of whether or not or you're going to pass, if you've got really good communication skills, most of the time they will give you the benefit of the doubt, and they will bump you up and pass you. So that's why, in terms of when students take this class, I treat this as like a, a writing course, because you're going to do a lot of writing in this course. Okay. 
okay, each and every week. And it's to practice, it's to get you ready for that CPA exam. Okay? So not only are you going to learn ethics, you're going to take quizzes and tests and all that kind of stuff, there's a lot of emphasis on writing. And when I get students feedback, I can't always give you detailed, extensive English department type feedback, meaning I'm not going to tell you transitive verbs and subject verb agreement and all this kind of stuff. I will give you very generalized feedback in terms of I see spelling errors, I see grammatical errors, things like that. Okay? I just physically do not have the time to give you the detailed feedback. If you have questions, if I put those comments out there week after week and you're not sure why I'm putting those comments out there, it is perfectly acceptable for you to send me an email and respond to me and say, Professor, I don't understand where we're making these mistakes. Can you help us? I, that's part of my role. Okay? Then I will address specifically what I see. Okay? But at this point, I would assume since you are all graduate level students, if I tell you there's spelling errors, you should be able to go back and figure out where those spelling errors are. A lot of time it's just careless errors. You just type too fast or input or whatever. Just do the just pay attention to the detail. Okay? That's something else that's very important for a professional accountants is paying attention to the detail. Okay? All right, so I kind of cover all that here and I've kind of gone over in class and you'll hear it again. So remember these ethic case assignments, your group modules, you will not see on this page, you physically don't see them, because these are group assignments, okay? If you want to see the weekly modules, you're gonna go to your group, you're gonna click on your group, and then at the top, you're gonna see group properties, it's gonna tell you who's in your group. You've got some tools that you can use within your group to help facilitate the process. And then here are your assignments down here at the bottom in this last block, okay? You'll notice it starts with case module A, B, C, D, E, F, and we go all the way to M, okay? So you've got 12 different case modules. These are the assignments for your group. You're going to submit one written document. So those are listed under my groups. All right. <coughs> Anybody have any questions about Blackboard? Again, because you guys are officially registered now, when you log into Blackboard through the ACC website, this course will be listed, and you just click on it, and this is what it's going to look like. Okay. So any communication I need to do with you guys, I typically do through Blackboard, so you get it either on the announcements page or it'll come to your ACC email. Both of those you need to check once or twice a week as we move through the semester. All right. Yes, ma'am. Uh, just to make sure, so for the quizzes, we have two attempts to take the same quiz? To take the same, same quiz, okay. yes. Okay. Yep. Once you've done the second, you'll, and you'll get the higher score of the both, both attempts. So if for some reason, some quirky reason, you did the second attempt and you got a lower score, you get the higher score. Okay. So, okay. Yes, ma'am. And will our test be no, your tests will be done in class. We'll, I'm trying to get, since it's early, I'm trying to get the computer lab reserved on Monday nights for the nights I know we need to do the test. And you'll just do the, the test in the lab, computer lab here on campus. Yeah, yeah this, this, for some reason, this, for you guys that have been in the professional accounting program, you know a number of the classes you go to the testing center for. For some reason, this particular class was not one of those classes that they allow us to use the testing center. So um, we try to use the computer lab. Now, if you're in the online sections, yes, you do have to use a, a testing center, or you can use the testing center if you were in the Austin metro area. And there is no charge for that as an ACC student. But if you're outside the Austin metro area, then you need to find a proctor. It needs to be at a university or a two-year college. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And you need to submit a form to me pretty quickly, um, like through the orientation exercise, so that I can verify the center and get all that stuff set up before the first exam. This first exam comes up pretty quick. So. Um, so to go back, we were talking about calendar before I jump off the blackboard and we start with the syllabus. So you'll see listed here, and when you click on each of these items, it will tell you the specifics about what each of these assignments are that are due. 
Um, this one that's over here on Monday, obviously, what do you think that is? Exam. It's your first exam, okay? So you'll do the first exam in class on Monday, June the 29th, okay? Um, your first exam will cover chapters one, two, and three, which you'll complete the first three weeks. And then you'll have a week that you can prepare, and then we'll do that first exam. Um, haven't decided if we'll do the exams first or class presentations first. We can talk about that a little bit later in the class um, because that just affects the classroom. It does not affect the online students. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes, about how you guys want to do that. Because I've got some flexibility and I'm willing to work with you guys in terms of how we're going to do that. But again, you know, click on those items. There's two items listed there. So July the 3rd, your chapter four quiz is due. And then your case module D. That will be your group work for that week. That will also be due Friday, July the 3rd by 11.59. Okay. So I want you guys to feel comfortable going out and using this calendar to find all of your due dates, okay, instead of relying on a syllabus with just a list of dates. Calendar serves the same function in my, in my mind. Okay. All right. If everybody's comfortable with Blackboard, if you would please, let's flip on the lights. And time for syllabus. And now, as I mentioned, if you lose this hard copy, don't worry about it because you have an electronic copy in the reference document section of Blackboard. The last page, if you want to flip to that, take a look at the last page. Let's start at the back, then we'll go back to the front. The last page you're going to remove, this is for the classroom students, you're going to remove that when we're done, or now. Um, you're just going to print your name, your student ID, a phone number on there for me. You're going to sign it and date it. And you're going to hand that in to me as soon as we're done covering the syllabus. Okay? Um, the reason I do this is because state law requires that you receive a syllabus in class the first week. This is my evidence that I can produce to the regulators and, say, and to my department chair and say, yes, I comply with the state law. See, here's my listing of students that got their syllabus. Um, that's only if they ask for it. Otherwise, it goes into a file in my office and nobody ever looks at it. So don't think that that information winds up on the internet because it doesn't, okay? Now, if you're in the online sections, as far as the syllabus, what you're going to do is in one of those questions, it will tell you to submit the statement of understanding, click on the form, click on the link, and you can go input that information and submit it electronically. For those of you in the class, on the orientation exercise, all you got to do is say, handed it in in class, and move to the next question. Okay? All right, so that's the last page. So let's go back to the front. Now, I'm not going to read this paragraph by paragraph, but there are some things in here that are fairly important that I will stop and cover. Um, first paragraph is just general information about this particular course. Um, it is worth three semester credit hours. Uh, we are scheduled for the classroom section to meet on Monday nights from 5.30 to 9.30. Uh, we'll come back and talk about that in a few minutes, okay? Um, because I understand 5.30 might be an issue for some of you. All right, this is an ethics course that has been approved by the Texas State Board of Public Accountancy, and as such, all of their requirements are included as part of this course. All right, paragraph number two, instructor contact information. This is the information that you need to get in contact with me. Remember I said the best way to contact me is through email um, or the discussion boards in Blackboard, okay? Um, you've got my office phone, you've got my email, the Blackboard site. As far as office hours for the classroom section, I typically will try to be out here by 4 or 4.15 on Mondays, so if you want to come in early and talk to me about something, um, I can be here, I'll be in the room, there's not a class before us, so I'll just kind of use the, the classroom as my office, 
and you guys can show up as early as 4 or 4.15. Or if that doesn't work for you, you can set up another time by appointment as long as I'm not teaching or something else. Um, I can generally make time to meet with you. If you have issues with Blackboard or technology, okay, now I know enough technology to do what I need to do, okay, but once it gets beyond helping you with issues you may have, I'm like useless, okay. Um, we do have an instructional on IT, um, an instructional support person, Latasha. Most of you guys know Latasha next to Katie's office. Um, if you are experiencing problems with Blackboard, you can give her a call. Okay, she can sometimes help you or help you work through those issues. So she is there for you as a resource. Please do not call Latasha with content questions. Okay. Things related to ethics or the three theories you're supposed to know, she can't answer those questions for you. She's not supposed to answer those questions for you. So please don't call her for that. Okay? Restrict communications to Latasha with only Blackboard technology issues. All right, bottom paragraph there is just a description of the course. I'll let you guys read through that. Uh, page number two, course prerequisites. Now this is pretty much is checked by Dr. People's office. And I really don't have access for most of you to be able to check this, so I'm assuming it's already been done. If for some reason it's been overlooked or hasn't been checked or you haven't met the prerequisite, come talk to me, okay? The prerequisite is that you should have already completed accounting 2331, internal control and auditing in our program here at ACC with a C or better, or if you took an auditing class or internal controls at another university, that meets the same prerequisite, but you need to have taken auditing or a similar course with a C or better in order to be in this class. Because okay? as we start working through some of these case modules and these case studies, a lot of the things we're going to discuss involve auditing, and so you need that background. All right. Um, stuff that you turn in. Your responses, your questions, your answers to those questions, make sure you use the computer. Do them in the appropriate software. Most of the time you're going to use Microsoft Word or a similar program. Make sure it's prepared on the computer, it's neat, it's professional looking before you turn it in. Um, there's a paragraph there for CPA candidates just reminding you, make sure that you're complying with the board requirements. This class does comply with their requirements. It's just a reminder. The next paragraph talks about competencies and skills, and that goes over to page three. You can go through that and read through that, but it's just a lot of educational background saying that in this class you should be able to read, you should be able to write and think and think critically, and we're going to use a lot of those types of skills in this class. In case you haven't figured it out yet, um, especially for the classroom section, this is not going to be an undergraduate lecture class where I stand up here and lecture and repeat all the information in the textbook to you guys. Remember I said I'm going to treat you like graduate students and the class is designed in that manner. So what that means is we're going to use our class time for discussion and presentation and you're going to show me what you know, what you've learned. Okay? Coming to class is not going to be a regurgitate, I'm not going to regurgitate and lecture to you about three different theories in chapter three or the framework for ethical decision making. Those at this point, you should be able to go read this particular material. It's not highly technical accounting material. Okay? It's pr pretty much common sense, actually, a lot of it. And it's a lot of theoretical based information on people that have done studies and research and what they believe about ethics. And the state board feels that that's important and you need to know that information. But at this point, most of you should be able to read that and understand that, maybe come to class with a few questions. So a lot of what we're going to do in class is presentations and discussion, and you're going to show me what you have learned. And so the monkey's going to be on your back. You need to come to class prepared, okay? Meaning you need to have read the case modules before the class presentation that week, and you need to be actively engaged in the discussion as part of the class discussion. And I'll tell you why that's important in just a minute. Top of page four, okay, required textbook supplies and materials. Okay, we are going to use a textbook, looks like this, for the people in the video, okay, 
It's called Ethics for Directors, Executives, and Accountants, and the authors are Brooks and Dunn, not the country music duo, but a couple of professors. Um, yeah, believe it or not, I actually teach in Canada, so. Uh, you need the seventh edition, pretty little picture of the green fields and the blue sky. All right, the optional is just formatting um, for your English, for writing, grammar, style manual. If you want to follow that, you can. It's optional. As long as it's presented professionally and coherently, I will not count off points if it's not exactly like the manual, the APA format. Okay. All right, course requirements. What do you need to do to pass this class for the state board to give you credit? Okay. Participate in class discussions and presentations. Okay. So in the classroom, you guys that are in the classroom, when we come to class each week, we're going to have discussions and we're going to have presentations. You will get a certain number of points for the discussion and um, you will get a certain number of points for the answers to those questions that you're going to submit after the presentations are done. Now, for those that are in the online sections, you, got, you folks do not have the ability to come to the classroom and discuss these issues. Hence, you guys will use the discussion boards extensively to discuss those questions and develop the answers to those questions. You will not, in the online sections, do the class presentations. So you're at somewhat of a disadvantage when you're taking this online because you don't get to see those presentations and participate. The only participation is through a discussion board, um, which I think is a big disadvantage, but we use that as the best tool we have available. All right, in addition to that, Everybody, both online and classroom, will take the assigned, complete the assigned chapter questions. Chapter questions are a group activity. Okay. Um, you will take the exams and the quizzes. Those are individual activities to be completed by each individual. And the last thing that you're going to do for me is you're going to create a personal ethics tool. Okay. This is your project. That is an individual project. And probably later this week or, or next week, I will post some examples for you guys, both in the classroom and online, of some examples of some tools that students turned in last semester. So you can see what I'm looking for and kind of what I expect in terms of that particular project. But we'll talk more about that later. All right, the next section, the academic calendar due dates. Those are just significant administrative dates. Uh, last day to drop with a W, Monday, August 3rd. Typically don't get a lot of drops in this class because um, you guys need to complete it so you can take the CPA exam. Last uh, term officially ends Sunday, August the 16th and grades are due by Wednesday, August the 19th. All right, in terms of the course objective, it tells you there what we're going to attempt to do. We're going to study ethical theories and issues. We're going to look at a number of case studies and we're going to talk about how these people made mistakes and how we can avoid those in the future. On page five, they, they list your learning objectives. What is it that you need to finish or complete by the time you've completed this course? You should be able to talk about and be able to illustrate that you understand each of those learning objectives. Okay, um, the last paragraph there on page five, group dynamics. Again, a significant portion of the work is gonna be done in groups. And because you're also, when you get into the, um, the real world and an accounting environment, a lot of work is also done in groups. And so you've got to develop that skill of teamwork, being able to work with a team. And I usually have at least one, t one group, one team, every t semester that struggles. Um, when, you, when you think about how did I get assigned to this group, uh, it's done randomly. The computer actually does it. Because I tell it just to randomly assign X number of students to each group, and it does it randomly. I don't go through and pick them, and so um, who you wind up with in, in your group is truly arbitrary. And like I say, usually at least have one group, people don't gel, the chemistry doesn't work, and it's kind of unfortunate, but guess what? That happens in real life sometimes too. So you kind of have to stick with that. So um, unfortunately, it doesn't happen very often but it does happen on occasion, so kind of keep that in mind. All right, on page six of your syllabus, how are you going to be evalu evaluated in this class? 
and how will you t how will your grade be determined? All right, first item there, individual activity, the chapter quizzes. Remember, those are the chapter quizzes. You get two attempts at each quiz. Um, each of the chapter quizzes is worth 10 points. The professional standards quiz is worth 20 points. For a total of 100 points or 12.5% of your grade. Okay, So make sure you do the quizzes. With two attempts, you should get close to 10 points each time. All right, the second item on your list there in the matrix, also in individual activity, unit exams. Okay. Now, the first two exams, the, fir the first exam will cover chapters 1, 2, and 3, and the exam will be 34 multiple choice questions from chapters 1, 2, and 3. Okay. Students ask me what's the best way to study for the exams. Read the material, read the chapters, and do the chapter quizzes. Um, if some of you that are in the program have talked to other students that have taken this course in the past, they will tell you, or you may have heard rumor, that your test questions are all your chapter quiz questions. That's not true anymore. Okay? Uh, you will have some questions that may look similar on the test, on your exam, that may look familiar to what was on your quiz, but they will not be the exact same questions. And you will see some new questions. So. Um, it's not just a matter of going back and memorizing answers. You need to understand the material. Um, the second unit exam will be chapters 4, 5, and 6. And again, that will be 34 multiple choice questions. The last test, your final exam, is a comprehensive exam, meaning there will be 50 multiple choice questions. And 20 of those 50 will come from chapters 7 and 8. The other 30 questions will come from chapters one through six. Okay. And I, I'll tell you more about I'll tell you more about that later in the term when we get to that. Each of those exams is worth 100 points each, 300 points, or 37.5% of your grade. All right. The next item, the written assignment. This is your personal ethics tool. Okay. It's equivalent to a test grade. What I expect you to be able to do by the time you complete this course for this particular assignment, and it doesn't necessarily have to be written, and you'll see this when you see the instructions, um, it needs to be something that you as an individual will be able to take with you when you leave this class. Okay? It's something that I want you to develop that incorporates the theories and the knowledge and something that sticks with you from this course. And it'll make more sense as we start working through the course. You'll, you'll understand what I'm saying. But when we study ethical theories, some of them you may go, ah, oh, that's, that's baloney. I don't believe that. I don't think that works. And then there may be some other theories that you may be, well, yeah, I think I agree with that. But the other part of that theory I don't agree with, but I really like this theory. So there may be things that you agree with and certain things that you don't agree with, and that's fine. Uh, but what I want you to do is to incorporate that into a tool, and we'll also talk about a framework for how you make decisions. Everybody has a different framework or a different way they go about making decisions. And I want you to incorporate that into an ethics tool so that if you are faced with an ethical situation at work, you've got a tool that you can pull out of your toolbox, whether it be a piece of paper, a poem, a song, a piece of art, whatever it is that reminds you about those ethical concepts and lead you down the path to make that decision. That's what the personal ethics tool is all about. Okay? So it's a very individualized project. And then it will be different for every individual in here. All right, that's worth 100 points, 12.5% of your grade. And again, that comes at the very end of the term. All right, group work, case analysis and discussion. There are 12 independent cases that are signed as a group assignment, and there are a number of questions, typically anywhere from three to five questions as part of each case module, depending on the uh, events of that particular case that you're going to study for that week. Okay. When we come to class, in the classroom part of this course, okay, one of the groups will be assigned each week to do a class presentation, meaning they will have done some, they will have read the case materials in the textbook. They will have looked at the questions. There, usually you have some supplemental videos that you will view as part of the cases to help you understand and give you context other than just reading a paragraph or two out of the textbook. And 
each, that group will do a class presentation for the entire class. Now, I expect the rest of the class will have done, read the case module, you've read what's in the text, you will have viewed the videos, and you guys will be ready to have a discussion in class. There are points allocated to the discussion that occurs in class. You also get points for those questions, the responses that you submit at the end of the week on Friday. Okay? The purpose of the class discussion is to help flesh out the answers to those questions. Okay? The folks taking this online don't have the benefit of having a classroom discussion. They have to do it in the context of a discussion board where they just post their comments. And so it's a little bit harder, I think, to do that than if you're part of an active class discussion. You can take notes. And then after the discussion, you'll have some uh, lab time to meet with your group and flesh all that out and come up with an answer, a written answer. Okay? So that's what the group stuff is all about. The case modules, there's 12 of them, three to five questions per module each week. And those are worth 20 points. Okay? Participation in class, the class discussion is worth five points. So if for some reason, if there's a week, you know you're going to be out of class, you can't be here because of work, you're only going to miss the five discussion points. It's not going to be a real killer, okay? unless you're out repetitively, and that, that would be an issue. All right. So all total, there are 800 possible, well, let me, let me back up. Your grade will be based on 800 points. Okay. There's a possible 810 points because you got 10 bonus points for your orientation exercise. At the end of the term, and, this, and the way that I do grading is I just give you points for all the assignments that you do. Five points for class discussion, 20 points for your group questions, 10 points for your quiz, and all I do at the end of the term is I add up the number of points that you've accumulated throughout the term, and then I look at my little scale here, and I assign grades accordingly. Okay? So I don't convert everything to percentages and rounding and all that kind of stuff. Don't mess with that. Just focus on the points. All right, middle of page seven. And this applies both to the classroom and to the online sections. Everybody needs to hear me. Absolutely no late homework will be accepted. Okay? I know things happen. I know you guys have families, you have obligations, you have jobs. But by the time you leave the class or by the time this video is over, you have got every single due date, you know, when each assignment is due. Okay? Something may come up, you may not be able to do a particular assignment, that's okay, move on to the next one, okay? Don't take the time to send me an email and plead to give me, uh, for me to extend additional time, because I basically don't do that. And students say, God, you are really harsh. You know, I, yeah, it is, it's a harsh rule. But it is also a rule that, as a professional accountant, you will have to live by. Because after you're gone, long gone from this class, you're going to have deadlines. If you do tax work, you've got tax return deadlines. If you do financial reporting, you have got SEC deadlines. They become a part of your life. So start now. Um, I, I know I'm not the only professor that does that, but I think I, I stick to it pretty much here. I know other professors here are a little bit more lenient with you guys, but that's basically my rule. There's no late homework. so. Uh, one assignment here or there will not kill your grade. All right, course policies. Paragraph A talks about a civility statement. Uh, basically, the context of that is that because in the classroom we have a lot of discussion, and online you guys will be doing a lot of postings, I want you guys to treat each other with respect. <coughs> uh, we don't call each other stupid or that was a dumb comment or that was idiotic. We don't use that type of language. Okay. This is a learning environment. It's a safe environment. We're here to um, educate each other. Okay? And as such, we treat each other with respect. You treat me with respect, I treat you with respect, and you treat each other with respect. That's basically the civility policy. If that someone violates that, I will call you out, ask you to put your stuff together, leave class, and come talk to me before I allow you to come back to class. We have a discussion about the behavior. Never had to use that in six years. So I don't plan on starting this term. So. All right, for the next paragraph, paragraph B, this is for the classroom, electronic devices. You need to keep those turned off, keep those out of sight, especially while class presentation and discussions are going on. Now, the exception to that rule is 
If you are one of those technologically savvy individuals and you want an e-text version of your textbook and you need your laptop or your Kindle to look at that during class, I really don't know why because most of what we do in class doesn't come directly out of the textbook, but if you want to look something up or whatever, uh, make sure you clear it with me first. Otherwise, typically, you don't need electronic devices as part of class, except maybe if you're the uh, group doing the presentation for that week, you'll, you'll have access to the podium. And if you want to bring a flash drive or email yourself the PowerPoint presentation, you can do that. You'll have access to the projector and to the screen. Okay. Um, page 8, attendance, class participation. If you're going to be out, it is not required. I do not require that you send me an email. What I will ask you to do in the classroom is to let your group know. Okay? Because a lot of the stuff that goes on in class is group work. And let's say your group is scheduled to do a presentation and you can't be here because you've got to be out of town. I expect you guys to work through that with your group. Okay? I don't need to be a part of that discussion. That's part of you learning to work with your team. So if you can't be here for one presentation, then you work it out amongst yourselves so that the next presentation, you do something and you pick up some of the slack for somebody else. You know, that's kind of how it works. Okay, if you're sick, can't find a babysitter, you don't need to email me that. All right, withdrawal. Again, last day to drop with a W, Monday, August 3rd. It's a couple of months into the semester, almost towards the end. Uh, incomplete grades. Incomplete is a very narrow situation. Okay, Based on the way the policy is written at ACC, you can only get an incomplete grade after the date of withdrawal and before the end of the semester. So your last day to withdraw is Monday, August the 3rd, so that means you would have to have a catastrophe between August 3rd and 16th. That's the only time that I incomplete policy is going to apply. So if for some reason, God forbid, you should get catastrophically sick during the term and you can't complete the course, withdraw from the course. Okay? I cannot give you an incomplete. If you get drastically sick, you wind up in the hospital on August the 5th and you are there until August the 15th, then I have latitude to be able to give you to issue an incomplete because something happened after the withdrawal date but before the end of the semester. But that is a very narrow policy. Okay? All right. Last paragraph on the bottom of page 8 and the top of page 9, they kind of go together. Scholastic dishonesty and plagiarism. Notice the top of page 9, plagiarism, the first sentence, bolded and underlined, plagiarism is taken very seriously in this class. I do. Plagiarism, academic dishonesty, speaks to your character. You as an individual. How far are you willing to push the line? And that's what this course is all about, is when, is when do you go beyond that line? When is it acceptable to push the line, but when do you go over the line? I thought I would never, ever have to use academic dishonesty and plagiarism in this class, but it happened last term. I was shocked. I could not believe it. Students, it happened in an online section, and I will still be very vague, very general, no names, but innocent and guilty, because there were guilty parties. Um, I had an incident about two-thirds of the way through the term, a particular group in an online section. Remember I said you do your uh, case modules, your, your, written, your, your uh, written questions, your answers to those questions, and you submit those as a group? Well, typically, what most groups do when they delegate the work is they delegate the questions to different group members, and that's fine. That's okay. I don't mind that. You work together to get the work done. That's, that's part of the learning process. Okay? What happened was one of the group members, and, and I know this. I know it's out there. I'm not stupid. You can go out, and you can Google, and you can find answers. And this particular individual found the solutions manual, the instructor's manual, for this particular textbook that we're using online. And for whatever reason, um, they said that they had deadlines at work, they didn't have time to finish their assignment. They basically copied the answers to the questions directly out of the solution, instructor's solutions manual. Now, you know, when I, when I, I'm old world, I'm traditional, I've been around 
the, the block a few times. In my mind, that is clear-cut plagiarism cheating. Okay? But then I had to take a deep breath and stop a second and think. All right. Student copied out of the instructor's manual, which they found online. Is it still cheating if they find the resource online? I think you have to answer that question for yourself. Copying it directly, I mean, almost word for word, yeah, that's plagiarism. That's somebody else's thoughts and ideas that you put into a document and called it your own without citing it appropriately. Okay. Um, bottom line is this. Part of being a licensed professional in any state is character. Students cheat, plagiarize, lie. That speaks to your character. That's an issue for the state board to deal with. Okay. What I discovered, because this was an online section, I sent an email to each member of the group because I didn't know who did it. I just knew what had been submitted for that group, that particular group. I immediately got some answers from some of the members of the group. I, I didn't do that. I, I, I don't know. You know, I, I didn't tell them exactly what had been plagiarized. I just said there's plagiarism in your assignment. And I will get to the bottom of it. And so a couple of emails came in from a couple of the group members saying, you know, can you give us more information? What you know, what was done? You know. And so I came back and I told them exactly what the issue was. And the guilty party at that point finally came forward when he knew when that individual knew that the rest of the group was going to figure out what had happened because they did. They assigned different questions to different members of the group. That's the way they did it. And this one individual had copied and the rest of the other, without telling the other members of the group, but now everybody is guilty by association because I don't know who did it unless somebody tells me. So the student that came forth, the resolution was this. They failed the course. I got a zero for that assignment, but they failed the course. I gave them an F. And they are no longer allowed to take any other accounting courses here at ACC. They're basically expelled from ACC. I will not have an individual with that kind of character, that kind of behavior associated with this program. There are too many successful, hardworking people that come to this program and are very successful for a couple of bad apples to ruin it. And so that particular individual, they do what they do, and, and there's people like that in the world. And you're going to run into people like that. You're going to be working with people like that. But I, I won't tolerate it. I just won't. So just just know right now, up front, if you if you think about it, if it even crosses your mind for the next eleven weeks because of a deadline or I mean just bite the bullet and tell your group I can't get it done and give up two or three points for that question, five points for that question. Don't risk your entire future by plagiarizing and being dishonest. Okay. We're going to study cases and cases and cases of people who have been dishonest, got caught, got punished, and you're going to figure out why they have, why they got punished. And you're going to be surprised that because the timing of when some of these things happened, these people didn't get punished severely. They got off very light. Okay. Um, that's not the environment that we operate in today. So you've got to take this stuff seriously. Okay. And I do when it comes to academic dishonesty and plagiarism. Just don't even let it cross your mind. Because I will not hesitate to fail a student. Because this program is too successful and people work far too hard to get through this program to have people tarnish the reputation. And I'm not going to be the cause for that, for letting somebody do that. So that's my soapbox. So don't, don't, just don't do it. And it's not. And, I was surprised that it happened in this class, but I have issues in other accounting classes that I teach with people copying as well in professional accounting programs. So, all right. Student rights, responsibilities, academic freedom. Basically, I encourage you guys to speak your opinions. You'll have, hopefully, some lively debates. That's kind of what I want to encourage as part of the classroom, is for you guys to have um, theories and have opinions about things that you think work, things that you think don't work, and why you feel that way and be willing to share that with the class. Okay? 
Um, so academic freedom is encouraged. Uh, students with disabilities, uh, if you have learning accommodations, you go through the Student Accessibility Services Office, please let me know early in the term um, before the exam so that I can make special accommodations for you. I can't do anything unless you go through their office and give me the paperwork. So if you're one of those individuals, make sure you get me the paperwork as soon as possible. Uh, page 10, safety statement, make sure you get to class safely. Uh, because of the time this class starts at 5.30, it's scheduled to start at 5.30. Um, rush hour traffic is generally an issue. Um, please get here safely. Um, one of my pet peeves that I have as an instructor is, and, and you guys are going to get to do this in just a minute when you do your own introductions. You're going to tell me what your pet peeve is. Um, one of my pet peeves as an instructor is for students to habitually now notice I said habitually, come in tardy. Okay. I know life happens, and it's Austin, and it's growing, and there's traffic, and on occasion, you're, you're going to be late once or maybe twice during 16 or 11 week semester. If it's once or twice, I typically am not going to say anything to you. But I have had students that week after week after week habitually come in late. That gets on my nerves. That's disrespectful disrespectful to the professor, to the instructor, and to your classmates, okay? Because it interrupts the learning process. Once or twice, not an issue, I'm talking about habitually late, okay? First priority is safety. Get here safe. Don't sacrifice your safety just to get to class on time. All right, use of ACC email, I mentioned that earlier. That is the best way to contact me. Go through Blackboard to send me an email. Uh, bottom of page 10, paragraph M, professional writing standards. Again, I will evaluate your writing responses that you submit as a group at a graduate level on a professional basis. So if you've got spelling errors, gram grammatical errors, things like that, there will be point deductions, and those are just carelessness. Okay? So pay attention to the detail. Submit well-written documents. All right, uh, top of page 11, student and instructional services, just some links there for some of the services ACC offers. Um, towards the middle of the page, Blackboard, we've gone through that extensively. I don't think I need to mention anything else there. Um, again, timely submission of assignments. No late homework, okay? All right, that's pretty much the syllabus, and I stood on my soapbox. Does anybody have any questions about the syllabus, anything contained in the syllabus? Okay, at this point I'll ask you to remove the last page, fill it out, and then pass those forward and I will collect those. At this point, I'm gonna stop the video because now we're done with the uh, stuff that applies to both sections and we're gonna talk about stuff that just applies to the classroom.